Welcome to another edition of The Deepest Law. We're on our 10th part of the Adam Curtis review. Uh, sorry I wasn't able to make it uh, last week. Let's just say something came up. Um, and uh, we are finishing up today Pandora's Box, which has been a six-part series. It's been uh, interesting, to say the least. The last part, where I had Horus on and should be back uh, next week, if all goes well, um, did make the uh, 7.8 thousand threshold. Uh, last I checked, it was on over 13, uh, and that'll do it. Uh, this also will have the 7.8 thousand threshold on it. So let us, uh, let us, uh, uh, oh, before we get going, I have to remind everyone, promo code mellow, promo code mellow, uh, 25% off all courses. And, um, and in fact, I've got a, uh, I've got, let me just play this. Hold on. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll just remind you again. I have my spring sale on. Pro oh, hold on. That was the outro. Let me try this one. Well, just before we get going, friends, if you like this channel, the best way to support me is to buy a course at the academic agency, but also you get something awesome in return, which is lifelong skills that you'll learn by doing the courses. There's currently a spring sale on, promo code MELLOW, 25% off all the courses, including the bundles, and I'll let you get on with the video. So there we go. <laughs> um, right, uh, yeah, and people always ask me, which one do you do first? Foundations of Writing is the one to start with. If you're short on cash, try Foundations of Research. If you are made of money, buy the, me buy the Mega Bundle. Uh, or even if you're not, it's still pretty good value um, in the current economic environment. All right. So we are uh, watching A for Atom, which is about uh, the it's about atomic energy or nuclear power uh, and the politics around it. So let us uh, make a start. <laughs> Did all this begin, Dad? Well, son, it's a very old story. It's, uh, it's so old, it's hard to say when it really began. Could have been back in 1540 when Copernicus identified the Earth as a speck of dust moving in an orbit around the sun. I'll just say that I uh, I do like the aesthetics of this period. This is probably when America was, uh, I don't know, still had something to be proud about. Or it could have been in 1905 when a young German physicist arrived at a fundamental truth that matter could be converted into energy and express it in the equation E equals MC squared. Then there were other dates. 1937, the first industrial atom smasher. 1942, the first nuclear chain reaction. 1945, the bomb. Somewhere in the course of these events, the dawn came up on the atomic era. It's going to have a tremendous effect on our town down there, son. It'll be felt in every town in America. And it won't matter if they make ships or shoes or ceiling lights. With atomic power, it will come benefits to mankind that we can as yet only imagine. The 
me. I've got a call with the governor. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think you've got to talk to him immediately. Uh, do, uh, do it immediately. We're operating almost totally in the blind. His information is ambiguous. Mine is non-existent. I don't know, uh, you know a couple of uh, blind men. Uh, now I'm staying around making decisions here. Extremely Adam Curtis start, by the way. By the way. <laughs> you know, let's get a bit of in, industrial electronica in here. <laughs> Very Adam Curtis. <laughs> In 1945, in the aftermath of war, scientists were heroes, particularly the physicists who had built the atomic bomb. They are men, said Life magazine, who wear the tunic of Superman and stand in the spotlight of a thousand suns. In the public imagination, atomic scientists had harnessed a terrifying power which could literally reshape the world. We knew the world would not be the same. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Dark. Many of the scientists who had worked on the atomic bomb felt a deep sense of guilt about what they had done. They were convinced they now had a moral duty to use the immense forces they had unleashed to better, peaceful purposes. What they did not foresee were the demands that would be made on them when their science came out of the laboratory and into the world of politics and big business. They would lose control and be forced to compromise and to deceive. So all of a sudden we found that as scientists and technologists, we were capable of changing in a massive way the framework in which society functioned. I and many others felt that nuclear power represented a major energy future for the world. You have to understand that this... Well, I'll just say, by the way, that um, when I was growing up playing video games in the... In the 90s, it was always the end game tech, wasn't it? Uh, it was always, you know, atomic energy and then fish, fission. That was always like the end game tech. And often um, in a lot of games, the tech tree would just run out. And uh, I remember some of the early civilizations and Alpha Centauri, it just says future tech because there's, you know, there was no more tech tree essentially. Um, so in my imagination, it, it was always like, well, you know, this power plant will get you this, this power plant will get you that. But if you get a nuclear power plant, you can basically do the whole map in SimCity, you know? That's how I thought of it. This was the first time that mankind had ever found an energy source which wasn't a routine natural phenomenon. Fire, of course, comes every time a lightning strikes a forest. Nuclear power was something else completely. We made it, and our ability to give the world a, what appeared to be, and still does appear to be, a limitless energy source for the future, uh, was to uh, any scientist and engineer, probably the most exciting philosophic concept you could find. Today, at Shippingsport, Pennsylvania, we began building our first atomic power plant of commercial size. Mankind comes closer to fulfillment of the ancient dream of a new and a better Earth. The scientists have provided us with an example of nuclear science at work. In this baton, there is a small source of neutrons. I bring this source of neutrons over to this place in which we have uranium, and we set up a bit of atomic fission. This now say what you want about Dwight, right? But can you imagine modern politicians explaining something like this, trying to explain to the public what the technology is? I mean, I'm not even sure Joe Biden could hold that thing in his hand. <laughs> we'll move the marker on the scale and finally light the light, and the project will be started. The President of the United States. 
Reese has just started off electronically in the groundbreaking power shovel 1,400 miles away in Shippingport, Pennsylvania. In this general mood of enthusiasm for science, politicians began to look to atomic power as more than just cheap electricity. It became the way to a better world. Это были годы, годы больших надежд. Только что умер Сталин, пришел к власти Хрущев, и атомная энергия рассматривалась как средство для достижения лучшего уровня благосостояния народа. Тем более, что мы все тогда были загипнотизированы ленинским лозунгом. У Ленина есть такой лозунг. Коммунизм – это значит советская власть плюс электрификация всей страны. Вот электрификация – это атомная энергия плюс советская власть, и значит коммунизм. Yeah, you can see why you could see why they would think that because it solves some of the scarcity problems that um, all economics comes up against essentially in their own minds. I'm saying um, also that the glasses of that guy. I was just thinking, like, you don't see people with big glasses like that anymore. Very much something of uh, that you saw back in the 90s and the 80s. You don't really see that much anymore. Anyone know why? Well, why don't they make glasses big like that anymore? At the very same time as Eisenhower began construction at Shippingport, Russia suddenly announced it had already built the world's first nuclear power station. What the Soviets did not reveal was that it took more electricity to run the plant than it produced. Then in 1956, another country entered the nuclear race. In this case, the atom's role was to recapture the glories of the past. Tomorrow, Her Majesty the Queen, here at Calder Hall in Cumberland, is to open the first nuclear power station in the world to operate on an industrial scale. Our prosperity in the Victorian era, wrote the government's scientific advisor, Lord Charwell, was due to the men who put Britain 80 years ahead in the use of steam power. Our prosperity in the coming century will depend on learning how to exploit the latent energy in uranium. Uranium. Well, now that is uranium. Now, one thing that I don't really understand is why, and maybe this documentary will help to explain it, why isn't the nuclear thing all go now? Everybody talks about renewable energy and clean energy and so on. I had always thought that nuclear was the end tech. So what? why are they building stupid windmills and solar panels and things rather than building lots of nuclear power plants all over the place? That's, I guess, my, my main question. I don't know the answer to that question. That little black thing I'm holding in my hand, two pounds of that size of uranium. And the potential energy which could be given off by this when properly used is equal to the energy, or the heat, if you like the word better, produced by... We should mention that there's a uh, Curtis connection here. Do you remember David Dimbleby from Oceans Apart? Well, this was his father. Uh, and he had... Jonathan Dimbleby was his, his other son as well. 2,600 tons of coal. That is your aim. Atomic scientists, by a series of brilliant discoveries, have brought us to the threshold of a new age. It is with pride that I now open Calder Hall, Britain's first atomic power station. The British government announced that by 1965, half the country's electricity would come from nuclear power. Now, now Dr. Leslie, we, see, it seems to me, in, in the building of this great place and its operation, have actually got ahead of the Russians and of the Americans. Yes, the atom is on its way to brighten our towns and to help manufacture our most dependable and indispensable household servants. In the late 50s, the Atomic Energy Commission made films that portrayed an atomic future in America. Scientists designed nuclear cars, planes and rockets. Others predicted whole new cities powered by vast atomic engines. 
if somehow a product could be atomic, it had to be good. Which are now being developed with atomic energy. Even your toothpaste may be a product of the atomic age. <laughs> well, people, people were saying, can you eat it like DDT? Well, <laughs> brush your teeth with atomic <laughs> uh, energy. Да, я считаю, что в общем это было это был золотой век физики и вообще появление энтузиазма у ученых, у специалистов. То они много и могут, много и могут. Вот что у них какие-то большие возможности появляются. Science for the world. See, I hate to go all uh, Spenglerian on you, but. I feel like something, there's some external or there's some spirit that has curbed our Western Faustianism in the past 70 years. Can't quite put my finger on what that is. But I feel like all this is kind of Faustian energy, as Spengler would talk about it. And there's something that has blunted and dulled it. We have not followed the way of science, but rather different ways. Let's continue. A dynamic world moving rapidly, flying, reacting to flashes on the radar screen, watching schedules where everything is calculated down to seconds and fractions of seconds. Science has permeated our very existence and can no longer detach itself. The station is to be situated on the shores of a forest lake. During the rest period, a magic silence reigns around the building site. But now, just when the scientists were being swept along on a wave of publicity, they began to discover it was going to be far more difficult to produce nuclear power than they had first thought. The problem was the cost of building the reactors. They were proving too expensive to compete with conventional fuels. In the Soviet Union, this led to increasing pressure to build fast, often without proper protection from nuclear radiation. In February 1957, the planner in charge of the whole nuclear power program died from an accidental burst of radioactivity. Давили на нас, конечно, экономические факторы, желание сделать подешевле, подоступнее эту энергетику, эту энергию. Ну, естественно, хотя мы понимали, что надо делать станцию безопасно и так далее, но все-таки экономика, она очень сильно владела нашим сознанием. Они настолько быстро двигались, что кое-что не успели просто еще сделать. И поэтому, может быть, мы недостаточно уделяли внимание рассмотрение вопросов обеспечения безопасности, в особенности в части тяжелой шабани. Then, in October 1957, there was a major accident in Britain. Emergency at Windscale Atom Plant, and the milk from 200 square miles of farmland is condemned as radioactive. The core of the reactor caught fire and spewed high levels of radioactivity across northwest England. Oh dear, I, I have never heard of this. Obviously, I've heard of Chernobyl. Never knew about this one. The radioactivity released was far worse than the public was told. It led some scientists to question the speed at which the technology was being pushed to compete with fossil fuels. They included the scientist who had built Windscale, Christopher Hinton. He had been put in charge of implementing the government's plans for cheap electricity. Sorry to detract, detract from the main call. I also enjoy the aesthetics of these, uh, these kind of milk barrels that they're using and the overalls and uh, I don't know I just dig like 50s aesthetics for some reason. Hinton was a thoroughly honest man and when he found that all sorts of bogus tales had been told about the relative costs of electricity from nuclear energy he was shocked he told me this that he was absolutely shocked he uh, realized that the estimates of the cost of nuclear energy compared with the cost of coal energy were cooked and when I said to him why didn't you do anything about it he said well I couldn't because the thing had gone too far you see so much had been committed then to a nuclear future no more shillings for the gas mother just splits an atom and supper's ready it must have been some billions that they'd already spent 
it was too late. It is, of course, a cliché that, that we're living at a time of such rapid scientific change that our children are accepting as part of their everyday life things which would have been dismissed as science fiction a few years ago. We're living, perhaps, in a more rapid revolution than some of us realise. The politicians were now committed to nuclear power. In 1960, a Labour politician, Anthony Wedgwood Benn, suggested an idea for a party political broadcast. To the hymn Jerusalem, the camera would rise from waving fields of corn to reveal an atomic plant. The conscious, planned, purposive use of scientific progress to provide undreamed of living standards and the possibility of leisure, ultimately, on an unbelievable scale. Nuclear scientists were now being carried along by a political enthusiasm for what science could achieve. Yet few of them in Britain, America or the Soviet Union knew how to fulfill the promises they had made. There's a new dawn breaking over our world. The hopeful dawn of the atomic era. What benefits But will two large American corporations, Westinghouse and General Electric, had already invested millions of dollars in nuclear technology. Well, it's unusual to me, or interesting to me, that they had to propagand propagandize it to this extent. You know, slightly, slightly odd propaganda too, which wouldn't look out of place in North Korea or something like that. <laughs> if, I, if I'm honest with you, <laughs> something a bit unusual about the messaging here. Um, anyway, let's continue. For them, there was no way back. In 1961, the new chief executive of General Electric told his staff, "We're going to ram this nuclear thing through." to new and even greater achievements in the atomic era. This is the hope that awaits us in this new dawn's early light. It's weird, isn't it? Anyone else finding this messaging strange? It's like they're worshipping the, the atomic, the atomic, <laughs> like nuclear power stations in a, in a quasi-religious manner. Strange. Like, like hyper hyper calvinism or something is this what this is hyper faustian calvinist calvinism as a religion <laughs> control over nuclear technology had passed from the scientists to the industrialists they were now about to take an enormous gamble to make nuclear power not only practical but profitable I'm Bert Wolf. I had General Electric's peace, peaceful nuclear power program. And this is a building which is made to model an actual boiling water reactor. We can come right over here to a facility where down low in the uh, cavity there is the boiling water reactor. General Electric and Westinghouse took the simplest form of nuclear reactor, originally designed for submarines, and redesigned it on a gigantic scale. These were then offered to power companies at knockdown prices. The manufacturers decided to bear any extra costs themselves. They gambled they could start a bandwagon which would make the nuclear business profitable. The key figure was the salesman. We would sell one at a time and each time we sold one we'd have a celebration. I can recall when we'd have meetings and someone would come in and said we sold a plant to somebody. And... Look, the Americans have got involved. General Electric got involved, and what we're watching now is the McDonaldsization of nuclear energy, isn't it? Let's make it the cheapest we possibly can, you know, get it get it out there like a like a McDonald's cheeseburger. We'd all stand up and shake hands and go out for lunch and have wine and toast each other. It was a great celebration. Then in the late 60s, uh, we began selling these by the tens, so it became a real business. The plants were sold often before they had even been designed. The power company accepted on faith the manufacturer's claims that because the reactors were big, they would achieve economies of scale. These sales were then cited to the next buyer as proof of the soundness of the manufacturer's claims. In the Can I just say, right, 
the the imagery here is just epic, and I wish. I mean, okay, you 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 can take or leave the fifties aesthetic style, but it just everything looks like it's from a Bond movie or something like that. And um, I kind of wish we still had like awesome aesthetics like this, just to marvel at, because there is a strange sense of wonder to all of this, and. Uh, you know, if there's anything lacking when I walk around modern towns, and it's it is that sense of uh, sense of wonder. And even though this, you could argue that this is a kind of cold utilitarian scientific form of it, it's still there. Whereas now, if you go to most towns, it's completely missing. Um, in fact, uh, the aesthetics that they're the kind of statues and things they're putting up. Are actually designed to do the opposite. They're designed almost to demoralize you now. Um, so I, I do appreciate this kind of era, just this kind of look and feel. Process the reactors became bigger and bigger, and it worked. The two corporations sold dozens of plants at home and abroad. Only Britain refused to succumb. A giant of limitless power at man's command. Man is building a brighter future for his children and his children's children in the new world of the atomic age. But senior nuclear scientists were worried about safety in these enormous plants. At the center of the reactor was the uranium core. Its heat powered the generators. The cores were now... <laughs> Neat Chad there looked like he could be mates with uh, the green giant who sells sweet corn. Remember? Green Giant. He looked a bit like him. He also looked a Neek Chad also looked a little bit like the Oscar statue. That's the other person he reminded me of. Os the Oscar statuette, you know. Now so large that if for any reason the flow of water to keep them cool were lost, they would melt. The scientists feared that such a core could then burn its way through the floor of the containment shell. In theory, there would be nothing to stop it emerging on the other side of the world. They called it the China Syndrome. The doubters included Alvin Weinberg, the man who had designed the original submarine reactor. But as long as the reactor was as small as the submarine intermediate reactor, which was only 60 megawatts, then the uh, containment shell was absolute. Now that's not quite right because... When you say the containment shell was absolute, do you mean it was safe? It was safe. But when you went to 600 megawatt reactors and 1,000 megawatt reactors, you could not guarantee this because you could, in some very remote situation, uh, conceive of the containment being breached by this molten mass. And that change, I would assert, occurred as a result of this enormous economic pressure to make the reactors as large as possible. So economics has unfortunately tainted the science. They've put economic concerns over the scientific ones. In 1964, a team of scientists working for the Atomic Energy Commission studied the possible consequences of a nuclear accident. They concluded, we have found in our present study nothing inherent in reactors or in safeguard systems as they now have been developed, which guarantees either that major reactor accidents will not occur or that protective safeguard systems will not fail. Should such accidents occur, very large damages could result. Oh dear. And that's when the nuclear dream began to fall apart. In 1965, scientists advising the Atomic Energy Commission tried to force the manufacturers to make their reactors safer. Good evening. Well, as I'm sure you've heard, we're going to have an atomic power plant here in New York. The Atomic Energy Commission has granted to Consolidated Edison permission to build a nuclear steam electric generating station at Indian Point in Westchester County. Westinghouse had already built a small atomic plant at Indian Point. Now they applied to the AEC for a license to build a giant reactor on the same site. At the same time, General Electric proposed a massive plant just outside Chicago. The scientists on the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards... I, mean, I would suggest that if there's anything you need to get health and safety right on, and I, you know, I'm not a big fan of red tape and bureaucracy and so on, but if you're ever going to get health and safety right, it has to be with a nuclear power plant. 
I mean, that's one area where it needs to be top notch. We're worried that a core melt so close to large cities could cause a disaster. They drafted a letter to the chairman of the AEC, Glenn Seaborg, which would by law have to be published. It said they would only agree to the plants if the manufacturers redesigned all future reactors to stop a molten core escaping if an accident, however unlikely, occurred. Seaborg was an ardent proponent of large reactors. We think that it will be possible to build huge uh, nuclear power reactors that will produce electricity uh, at the rate of millions of kilowatts and desalt seawater at the rate of hundreds of millions of gallons a day. Seaborg asked for the letter not to be published. The impact on the industry might be serious, he said, and the public might misunderstand it. He and his fellow commissioners would deal with the problem in private. All I can say is that we uh, tried to take such steps as we could to follow their advice uh, to make the changes that uh, would make them safe. So what? I, I, I would agree, basically, uh, you know, based, do not tell the public uh, about what is happening. They won't understand it because they're not scientists. Keep it between yourselves, make expert decisions. Uh, in principle, I agree with these things. Um, unfortunately, the people in all those positions today are, are all idiots. <laughs> and that's why we can't go by those sorts of rules anymore. But at this time, um, I would... Uh, you know, they were, were probably closer to a point where you could do that sort of thing, I would say. What did you say to the manufacturers? Uh, we uh, had meetings uh, with the uh, manufacturers and uh, discussed the uh, issue with them. I think they were doing the best they, they could, and uh, I don't know that we ever made a tremendous uh, push to try to uh, get them to change their whole manufacturing system. Why not? Oh, I, th I think it was, uh, at that time, not regarded as a feasible approach. We asked uh, General Electric to come in and discuss how they might cope with this, and uh, in effect, they came in and showed the uh, problems uh, that would arise with their containment and indicated uh, they didn't think uh, they wanted to continue selling uh, power reactors if uh, this, if they were going to have to deal with uh, the core melt problem. Westinghouse showed a something called a core catcher, but no proof of how it would work. Neither company was uh, anxious to deal with the problem, obviously. Well, General Electric, in effect, threatening you. They're saying, if you insist on this, then we'll just pull out of this. It was a program. kind of uh, threat, I think, yes. What would have happened if you had said, I think these plants that are being built, these enormous plants by General Electric and Westinghouse, are potentially dangerous? What would have happened if you'd said that? Well, that's a hypothetical uh, question. Uh, you had I'd, the power to do it. What would, what would have happened? I don't think we had the power to stop them. Uh, well, we could have uh, we could have refused to license them, of course, uh, but uh, again, I, I think that in the context of the of the times, it, it's uh, it, it's uh, not uh, a, a question that uh, that makes much sense. Indian Point and the other reactors were built without the redesign the committee had asked for. Instead, the AEC ordered a massive upgrading of the capacity of the emergency cooling. Another immensely cool. Just another immensely cool. Look at that. But, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I very much dig the uh, these sorts of spaces. You know, of the capacity of the emergency cooling systems to prevent a core from ever melting. In effect, the manufacturers had got their way but they had set a terrible trap for themselves. In contrast, in the Soviet Union, the grandiose nuclear plans of the 50s had remained on the drawing board. The Soviet planners were unconvinced they could be constructed cheaply. The physicists and engineers spent their days designing reactors that would not get built. Then, in the mid-60s, Brezhnev came to power. He believed that the road to communism lay through giant technological projects. The nuclear power program began again. It was dominated by Anatoly Alexandrov, a 
famous physicist who had designed what was known as the RBMK reactor. His team planned giant versions to be built around Soviet cities. I The idyllic picture of a nuclear Eden masked a reality in which safety was barely even considered. The reactors were built at great speed to cut costs and to fulfill the Soviet plan. Some had no protective containment at all. Well, one of the fascinating things that uh, Curtis has done throughout Pandora's box, which I want to mention briefly, uh, one, of course, he's shown the dialectical relationship between the USA and the USSR that existed during the Cold War and how they were kind of out trying to outcompete each other or they were mirrors of each other. But the other fascinating thing that he's done is he's shown a lot of um, kind of normal, everyday or high-flying high society Soviet Union, which is something that we don't get to see a lot of. You know, I, growing up in the 80s, my complete image of the Soviet Union was people queuing up to get potatoes, um, you know, when there was a shortage in the supermarket. This was in the 80s, obviously. Um, you never really got to see, like, this side of the Soviet Union. And uh, that fascinates me a, a little bit. Um, maybe our image of what the USSR was like is a little bit too coloured by, you know, contemporary propaganda. Despite the high pressures of steam, large amounts of water contaminated by radiation from the reactor core were pumped into giant open ponds. Но поскольку я участвовал в этих работах, был на площадках, где строилось, то я видел, что в погоне за успехом как бы потеряли чувство меры. Complete safety for the attending personnel is ensured at the atomic power plant. The slightest radioactive contamination can be detected with the aid of radiation monitors. At the exit of the washroom, there is a dosimetric installation. This will not let you out if there is the slightest trace of radioactivity about you. При Брежневе началось активное разложение, воровство, пренебрежение к делу и так далее. И когда к концу 70-х годов эра Брежнева достигла своего апогея, это совпало с максимумом развития ядерной энергетики, и стало это просто все понятно, и это видели многие. Попытки как-то решить это дело путем служебных записок не имели значения. Нужна была публикация в крупном журнале. Кориакин и его инженер написали артикул в газете «Коммунист». Это открыто Александров. It criticized the lack of safety in the design of the plants, where they were sited, and the growing question of what to do with the nuclear waste. It caused a sensation. Была создана специальная пресс-конференция, где было сказано, что эта статья клеветническая, что это все не так, все это неправда. Хотя это было уже многим ясно, так как вот это вот я бы сказал научная мафия во главе с Александровым институтом атомной энергии. Но она заняла удобное положение, потому что все награды, ордена, звания, поездки за границу и всякие, как у нас в России говорят, пироги и пышки достига доставались им. А синяки и шишки доставались простым инженерам в других институтах. Ну, это довольно широко бывает в жизни. Часто бывает в жизни. Britain, meanwhile, struggled just to make her plants work. So far, the first of the advanced gas cool reactors being built here on the Kent coast at Dungeness hasn't produced a single watt of electricity. Ordered 
at a cost of eighty million pounds and due to this is this is fascinating. I didn't know that uh, they just weren't functioning for all this time. Very interesting. I did. To be commissioned in 1972, it might just start producing electricity in 1977. And really, nobody has a clue how much it's going to cost us. So, why is it that things have gone wrong? For a start... It is with pride. When Calder Hall was opened, we were leading the world by three years. I can only feel terribly sad because I, I've seen that lead thrown away. I, I find it difficult to put it any other way. A nuclear generating plant is as harmless as a... Uh... It's as harmless as a chocolate factory. But a lot more nuclear power is needed. Nuclear power. The power to keep America turning on. Turning on. Turning on. In America, the enormous nuclear plants ordered in the 60s were nearing completion. The engineers in charge were beginning to discover the trap they had set themselves by failing to redesign the containment. If a molten core could not be contained, then the emergency systems to prevent a meltdown would have to work, whatever happened. The engineers had to anticipate everything that could possibly go wrong. In the enormous complexity of the plants, this was proving impossible. I mean, <laughs> it's hard for me not to start thinking watching this that uh, the uh, it was that guy who used to stalk the chat, saying nukes are fake and all of that. Martin uh, Martin Webb can't help but think that maybe uh, maybe there was a bit of emperor's. Emperor's new clothes here. Um, I mean, there must be a people. The thing is, there are nuclear p power plants working right now, right? Uh, I know Germany's got a lot of them, so they do work. Uh, I mean, famously, Homer Simpson worked in a, in a nuclear power plant, didn't he? So they they must actually work. But uh, the the fact that it's the mid seventies here and they haven't got anything up and running is a little bit interesting to me. One of the main things we began to discover is that our... Oh, sorry, it's France who's got a lot. France, oh yeah, Germany closed theirs. It's France It's France that has the nuclear power plants. Sorry, that's right. And Germany, under their stupid Olaf Scholz, has closed closed them. He, he is terrible. He is a, his approval rating is less than... 24% last I checked, making him the least popular leader in the entire world, Olaf Scholz. Many people are saying he's the worst leader Germany has ever had, uh, Chancellor, King or otherwise. Um, uh, yeah, I'll also say that we've got about 20 minutes left of this. And uh, if you're going to get your super chats in, get them in now because uh, we're not going to hang about today. All right theoretical calculations did not have a strong correlation with reality. While the regulations required emergency car cooling systems, pumps and valves, we didn't really have any basis for knowing that those pumps and valves would actually prevent a meltdown of the reactor. Because the, the degree of complexity of trying to predict what will happen inside a huge reactor in the midst of a pipe break, we couldn't make any judgments because we didn't have any facts on which to make judgments. During the winter of 1971, a series of tests of emergency core cooling systems were performed at the AEC's private testing site in Idaho. Accidents were simulated in a small model of a reactor. In each case, the emergency systems worked, but the water failed to fill the core. Often it was forced out under pressure. Despite this, both the industry and senior members of the AEC argued that the full-size safety systems were safe enough. I think what happened was the federal government and the nuclear industry decided that the absence of proof of danger was almost as good as proof of safety. In other words, even though we had done experiments that cast doubt on whether the safety systems would actually work if we had an accident, we still had that backup that, well, maybe 
an accident won't happen while we continue to work to perfect the design of the emergency system. And we couldn't announce to the public that we, having told the public that the plants were safe, we now had to disclose to them we were wrong, and then the fact that all these safety systems we told you about, actually, they might not do any good. My goodness, the uproar would have been, we, we, we all probably would have been fired. That would have been the end of this wonderful technology from the standpoint of us. And we just couldn't admit that we had been wrong. And plus, of course, you understand with this one experiment, it didn't prove that the emergency systems wouldn't work in all circumstances. I agree with him. I agree with not telling the public. I I, I understand what he's saying. I call it. What is your principal concern right at this minute? Well, my principal concern is that we got an accident that we never been designed to accomplish. On March the 28th, 1979, a series of human and mechanical errors at the Three Mile Island plant exposed the core. It reacted with steam and produced hydrogen, which exploded. None of the emergency teams could understand what was going on inside the reactor. Then suddenly, this helicopter detected a large radioactive cloud drifting towards the nearest town. The voices of the commissioners in charge of the disaster were recorded by a dictaphone that had been left running on a table. What was their time scale involved there? Hours. Hours before what? Before you had a core melt. Before you had a core melt? Uh, you would have hours to when you were generating fission products uh, in a core melt kind of situation through the containment. I think, uh, you know, we got the best we got, Joe, so, and they're not coming up with answers. We got the... Well, don't you think as a precautionary measure there should be some evacuation? Probably, but I must say it's operating totally in the blind, and I don't have any confidence at all that if we order evacuation, we won't move people place where they've already got a piece of the dose they're going to get into an area where they will get uh, another piece, you know, they will have had 0.5 of what they were going to get, and now they'll move someplace else and get 1.0. Uh, now, Joe? Yes, sir. I think to me I've got to call the governor. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think you've got to uh, talk to him immediately. To uh, do it immediately. We're operating almost totally in the blind. His in information is ambiguous. Mine is non-existent. I don't know, uh, you know, a couple of... Uh, Blind men uh, now have to stagger around and make a decision here. Don't we know that it's been stopped? We just got a lot of communication with the control room. For four days, the engineers at the plant watched helplessly as a bubble of hydrogen grew inside the damaged reactor. What they feared most was a further massive explosion. But they knew that if they tried to force the bubble out of the reactor, it might move downwards and completely uncover the core. They would then face the nightmare of a meltdown. The engineers were trapped by the consequences of an accident no one could have anticipated. It was a point they made to the commissioners again and again during the incident. It's, it's a failure mode that's never been studied. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, I, the thing that impressed me was uh, how little we really knew about the situation. Um, it was very hard to figure out uh, what uh, was happening. There was a lot of confusion on everyone's part, uh, both on the company's part, the government's part, and a lot of other people who were participating. It does feel, I mean, I mentioned Faustianism early, earlier on. This feels like the other side of Faust, doesn't it? It's like playing with, uh, playing with forces you don't quite understand. However, Got to break a few eggs to make an omelette, maybe. Uh, and I think this had a very strong effect on the public. Basically, to see all the men in the white suits or white lab coats who are supposed to know uh, on TV, basically scratching their heads, uh, made a lot of people wonder whether things were as much under control as they had been told. Three Mile Island. The President's Commission estimated the cost of the accident could reach $1.8 billion. That's a lot of money to pay for a power plant that may never work again. But Three Mile Island wasn't the first nuclear accident, and it won't be the last. In 1979 alone, there were 20 nuclear incidents that could have led to the catastrophic meltdown of an American nuclear power plant. Don't get sold on nuclear power. We can't pay the price. They don't have their 
energy policy will benefit the nuclear industry and the oil companies, and they have given only lip service to the solar industry. <sighs> oh, I just hate them. <laughs> I'm still, I mean, okay, yeah, there are accidents and stuff. I'm still basically on the side of mastering nuclear power. There were protests against nuclear power throughout the world. In the public's imagination, it was transformed from something good to something bad. Much of the anger was turned on the nuclear scientists. It emerged that they had deliberately concealed many of the risks and uncertainties they had discovered at the very time when they were publicly promoting the wonders of nuclear power. We would, in effect, have solved the energy problem forever, permanently, which in itself is just an, uh, an extraordinary new dimension in, in human experience, to have energy, which is the ultimate raw material. Of we recognize that there was a risk, but we always deemed the risk to be really acceptable. But now I guess I'm more mature, uh, <laughs> older, I realize that the decision of what is acceptable is not something that we technologists can make, uh, it's something that the public makes. No, no, that is exactly the wrong takeaway. It's the wrong takeaway. Those hippies just need to be kept in the dark and not told what's going on. Yes, there may be a few accidents, I accept, as a, as a risk of doing science. But uh, this is the wrong lesson that this guy's learned. It's all over. It's all over, folks. Why did you think it was something you could make then? You know, I guess... It never occurred to me to, uh, to ask this question. Uh, the nuclear enterprise had always been, well, it started out as a secret enterprise, of course, and the notion of the public being intimately involved in very complicated technical issues Issues which went way beyond the competence of... Look, the neat chat has faded. Oh, F's for the neat chat. Any member of the public, it just didn't seem that that was the right way to do it. And I think the basic question is, can modern intrusive technology and liberal democracy coexist? The power rises sharply. The rated power level is exceeded. I keep in my safe records of the operator's telephone conversations on the eve of the accident. It makes one skin crawl to read them. One operator telephones another and asks, the program here states what must be done, but a lot has been crossed out. The other thinks for a moment and then says, Act according to what has been crossed out. In Kiev, we said all... Can I just say, this, this attitude of, oh, there have been a couple of disasters, therefore we're going to give up. I mean, every great technology in history had this trial and error process, uh, whether it was bridge building, whether it was, uh, you know, steam power, anything I can think of. Uh, had this process where you don't get everything right straight off, you know, mistakes are made, accidents happen and so on. But, um, you know, this is, uh, this is basically a very, very, in my view, passive and womanly way to respond uh, to it. Uh, you know, just don't, don't just quit. You know, make it better, make it stronger, don't cut corners, etc. For the nuclear power station, it didn't enter my head that we were moving towards an event on a planetary scale. On the following day, when I went into the ruins of the reactor in an armored troop carrier, I had that sense of anger that there were no solutions, no technical remedies worked out in advance. Of course, we had said such an accident could only happen once in a thousand years. 
but who said that this once would fall in our year 1986? <laughs> Человека, с которым я встретился осенью 1986 Liquid nitrogen was poured in to freeze the ground underneath. By luck, the nitrogen gas also began to stifle the graphite fire. And then on the fifth day, for reasons that still no one understands, the core began to cool. Despite this, throughout the disaster and the terrible dangers, Legasov remained a staunch defender of nuclear power. The maximum based dose was 0.7 rentgens per hour. Over the reactor, we got between 0.3 and 0.5 rentgens. Do you think we'll be able to have children? Yes, don't worry. Are you sure? I've been working with radioactivity since 1964, and I've got kids, don't worry. In the months that followed, Legasov changed his mind. In a long taped interview with the then Soviet MP Yuri Sherbak, he gave a damning criticism of the whole nuclear power program. The problem, he said, was the demand that was made of the technology. Удивительная была встреча наша с Легасовыми, удивительный разговор. Он как-то очень доверительно, очень откровенно вдруг начал мне рассказывать все боли, все то, что он пережил в Чернобыле. It's easy to think or imagine that the enemy is the nuclear reactor, but the enemy isn't technology. I have come to the paradoxical conclusion that technology must be protected from man. In the past, the time that included the old reactors, the time that ended with Gagarin's flight into space, the technology was created by people who stood on the shoulders of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. They were educated in the spirit of the great humanitarian ideas, in the spirit of a beautiful and correct moral sense. They had a clear political idea of the new society they were trying to create, one that would be the most advanced in the world. But already in the generations that succeeded them, there were engineers who stood on their shoulders and saw only the technical side of things. But the sky is based. This guy is based. But if someone is educated only in technical ideas, they cannot create anything new, anything for which they are responsible. The operators of the reactor that night considered they were doing everything well and correctly, and they were breaking the rules for the sake of doing it even better. But they had lost sight of the purpose, what they were doing it for. Then two years to the day after the accident, and for unknown reasons, Valery Legasov committed suicide. Oh, this world is at a tremble with his strength and mighty power. They're sending up to heaven to get the brimstone fire. Take warning, my dear brother, be careful how you plan. You're working with the power of God's own holy hand. Atomic power, atomic power was given by the mighty hand of God. Atomic power, atomic power, it was given by the mighty hand of God. In the golden age of science, at the time when society had its most optimistic view of science, it basically had a wrong-headed view of science. It had the view that 
this form of the technology was the inevitable form that it had to take. And that if that was the form it took, then it must be the right form. Forty years later, we have a similarly naive view. It's no longer tinged by hope and optimism, it's tinged by pessimism and fear. But we still have this view that society can't shape technology, that the form that the technology takes is the form we must accept. And just as it wasn't true in 1950, it's not true today. This is not a story of technology run amok, although that's how many people would understand it to be. The history of nuclear power is a history of, of political and economic and social decisions being made about a technology. And the, the key decisions weren't made by the technologists. They were done in the business realm. What science and technology gives you is a range of possibilities. And those possibilities can take you in any number of directions. It's potentially a liberating force. But to get there, society has to stop sleepwalking and start realizing that it's, it's not a scientific choice, it's not an engineering choice, it's a moral choice. Well, George, does that answer your question? It sure does. It's given me a whole new perspective. Here's Brian Eno again. After World War II, there was a scramble between America and the USSR to develop ever more powerful... Well, that was a good ending to Pandora's box. Curtis hit it out the park again, I think. Very interesting documentary. A um, few bits I didn't really know there. I was under the impression that nuclear power was up and running in the 50s onwards, really. Um, I didn't realize that it took quite as long as that to get going. And it explains some of why people aren't so up for it uh, these days. Although I still think that of the available technologies that there are, still seems to be the best one as far as I can tell. Um, you know, the if you have a look at the total uh, death toll of uh, nuclear uh, nuclear power plant failures and compare it to the death tolls of many other technologies, it's tiny. Like compared to the automobile, for example, it's nothing. Or compared to, I mean, you'd have to pull up stats, but I wonder how many people have died in coal power plants over the years. Or I wonder how many... Um, uh, People have died from gas, for example. You know, um, I, I can imagine that the numbers uh, are either greater or comparable in, in each of those cases. So it does feel it does feel like there's a lot of weird public hysteria over the nuclear ones. Um, I mean, for understandable reasons, I guess, because the contamination of radioactivity is of a different nature to some of those at some of those others um but still i feel that people maybe go a bit too far when it when it comes to this topic um okay so let us have a look then um uh, i mean it is possible that uh one of the problems is that it's just economically not viable i.e if you're going to do it where it was almost like very little risk it would not be it would not make money um it would simply be a cost center for you know the government as a utility say and it wouldn't be viable for general electric but if that's the case so be it you know that could be the that could be the the cost for the infrastructure but then you think well this is the cost of making everything else work that could be you know so some things are just costs. Some things are just infrastructure that you need for everything else to work, right? So just whatever it costs, make just pay it. Um, it obviously does work because it works in France and it works in Japan, of course. And yeah, okay, they've had they may have added one or two accidents, but it works, right? Um, okay, anyway, uh, let me have a look at some super chats. Chris Prim Primer has given ten U.S. dollars for great justice. Well, thank you very much, Chris Primer. 
I don't actually know what that is in reference to, sir. Um, I've got an idea of what it could be about, but you haven't specified. But uh, yes, indeed, you should stand for justice. That is good. Belfast Knight says, it's like how tech bros sold data centers throughout the West US. The data centers consume astronomical amounts of power, uh, of water, and are de desertifying the West. Uh, Arizona had, had to urbanize and fight for the CO river water rights. Um, interesting. Uh, I remember Thomas Sowell wrote about that in California similar thing in california before as well which uh, is quite kind of interesting um cairo Scuro says i appreciate another adam curtis stream thanks aa well uh, i said i will carry on going until it doesn't hit the 7.8 target we've made it through two series now and we did an extra one-off documentary as well the the iran one um one of the things i'm a little bit uh, apprehensive of moving forward is whether Living Dead or some of the subsequent Curtises are going to get hit by copyright. Um, I'm hoping they won't be because they all are on YouTube already. And usually if something's already on YouTube, they're all right with it being up. But, you know, who knows? Um, it could be that... Uh, we won't be able to go live, in which case I'll have to pre-record them, but we'll cross those bridges when they come. Adam E says, nuclear energy isn't part of the modern green agenda because it actually works. And once you deliver the utopia, you can no longer grift off it by a shovel-ready government contract. That's a good point. Um, maybe nuclear does present problems of hyperabundance. I've got a book by a uh, Marxist uh, scholar here called Green Capitalism. I did a stream on it once, a um, cigar stream it was, and um, he's called James Hartfield. And uh, he, he, he reckons that uh, capitalist firms, corporations have manufactured scarcity um, so that you cannot have abundance for their own, for their own gain, essentially. Um, and I, I think he made quite a lot of good points and he named names and he showed evidence of that in that book. It's not very big either, that book. Um, Spasticus Autisticus says, notice how the Soviet technicians were able to publish their concerns in the communist while the American technicians could not. Yes, that was very interesting, Spasticus Autisticus. Um, I have also been interested uh when i've been reading uh uh stalin stuff that he often like responds to letters that various comrades write in i'm thinking like that's a bit weird in this very totalitarian state that you still have the right to write to stalin he might also reply to you as well um uh, something i've wondered about um adam e says the chernobyl miniseries on hbo gets five stars from me Highly recommended watching if you haven't already seen it. Uh, yeah, that did that was very highly thought of when it came out. Uh, I do wonder why Chernobyl got a min mini series on HBO, and if it if it was or if it is the fact that the powers that be want to keep Chernobyl to the front and center of your mind, so you distrust nuclear power. You know, I always I always ask that question like. Who gains from this and why why is this messaging being put out there rather than you know something that sheds nuclear power in a good light um bosco true says the money power plays both sides they always win um well i would say they always win until they don't and when they don't win um <laughs> that will be a time to celebrate i suppose uh, it is um spangler talks about how money power can, money power can only really be counted by force it will it will be a, a leader who's prepared to use force um in the current environment as things stand today it will take a leader 
the president of the United States, for example, to stand up to them, uh, as Putin stood up to the money power in Russia, as the Chinese, as the Chinese government within China stands up to or doesn't allow money power to reign over their society. Um, that is what it will take. Uh, and it will it can only be the United States power structure as things stand uh, because they are the head of the empire. That's what it will take or an overthrow of the American government, which isn't going to happen. So we'll have to take a like, heroic will on, on one of these presidents, right? And um, one of the things that interests me is that a lot of presidents get to, you know, when they, when they leave, they have a farewell address. And a number of different presidents, Truman, Eisenhower, um, obviously JFK died, so we didn't get to give one, but he has got interesting speeches too. Uh, Nixon talked about the media. Um, lots of different presidents have kind of given warning shots through history and tried to, if you read between the lines a bit, tell the public and tell everybody what was happening and what would need to happen. Uh, so, you know, never say never. They don't always win. They have won in recent history, but they don't always win. Um, so there we go. Uh, yeah, I mean, Andrew, Jack Andrew Jackson got one over on them as well. They don't always win. All right. Um, that is it for today and for this week. I will be back uh, next Monday for Cigar Stream. Um, looking forward to it. I think next Monday Cigar Stream is with... Uh, who is it with again? Oh, yes. It's with my friend Nomad, who's going to be talking all about the dollar system and how that works. So that will be interesting uh, to talk about. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekends if you catch up with all of my stuff if you haven't seen it already make sure this stream hits 7.8 thousand buy my courses at the academic agency but most importantly of all ladies and gentlemen get out we'll go on in this town as long as i'm living as long as i'm living here it is well, maybe you should have been living here. well that's easily fixed